Hey everybody, uh, it's time to go ahead and get started. Week 10, um, a lot going on, but we've got some content I wanna cover today. Uh, we will almost certainly not take the whole time. So if we're getting close near the end, I'll skip the break and we'll just kind of move through and continue. Of course, you can always step away and come back and <clears throat> watch the class recording later. So uh, Maria's here in class today. I'll make her co-host right now so that her name will appear at the top of the participant list. And if you have any questions, you can send those to her. She'll send them on to me, or you can, of course, use the raise hand feature. Um, before we get into the technical content, I did just want to take a moment and um, acknowledge that this is an incredibly hard situation we're all in right now. You all saw my note on the Canvas discussion board. Um, offering some resources in case you're in need, but um, I think it'd be uh, not great for me to just continue without really uh, at least briefly mentioning everything that's going on. So for those of you who are um, being really affected by everything that's happening, I'm sorry. And um, I will be sending a note to all the students in the department later on today. And there will be additional word coming from the provost later this week, or the uh, one of the vice provosts about uh, a change in grading scheme for spring quarter. So I can uh, announce now that uh, legislation has passed the faculty senate that will essentially permit you to opt in to a pass fail grading scheme for this quarter. Um, although you'll be able to first view the course grade that I've assigned you. And then if you prefer to have a pass fail grade, you'll be able to opt in to that. So I think that's really welcome news. Uh, it's a nice step that the university is taking. Uh, I wish they would have taken it sooner, quite honestly, but they didn't. And <clears throat> many of you will have questions about any potential impacts that might make with regard to um, progressing in the chemi program, GPA. So the advisors are aware that this is happening and we'll be planning some communication later this week. Just know that you won't have any decision to make until June 17th when the grades become available. So as it is right now, you should continue um, as you're planning and, and, and continue working on the course material to the best of your ability, uh, following my guidelines if you need to be excused from any material and uh, we'll just make the best of um, everything that we can. And um, yeah, so um do reach out if you have any initial questions or concerns and i'm also awaiting word from the provost on what this is going to look like and when we'll just uh take it take it as it comes the subject of today's lecture is kind of the final module we're going to not really dig into too much technical content and instead try and make sure you all have a, a grounding or base in a fourth type of separation technology that um, relies on equilibrium principles um, primarily known as adsorption and the subversions or sub subtopics within that uh, of ion exchange and chromatography. So we're going to talk about these three subjects kind of at a qualitative or semi-quantitative level. And normally I'll kind of use a couple examples at the beginning of class to introduce the technology, um, but I'll intersperse those throughout the whole lecture today in these three different sections. As a reminder, there's an additional homework assignment due this week quiz on Friday and the project, uh, I have extended the project deadline. Um, so the project is now due next Wednesday. I announced that on Canvas and just of course reach out if you all uh, need anything or have any questions or concerns. So last Tuesday, just a quick recap. Um, oh, sorry, I kind of mixed up the recap and announcements, <clears throat> but we talked about reverse osmosis. It was the last section of membrane separation. I've seen you all working on the homework asking questions. So that's all good. I'm not going to dwell on that too much. If anybody does have any questions about the technical content um, of last Tuesday's lecture that you want to recap or anything else, send them to Maria right now and she'll send them on to me. Otherwise, we'll move on in just a moment. And then uh, you'll receive an announcement on Canvas, probably multiple announcements. But I did just want to let you know that we'll offer some bonus points if you complete the online course evaluation. So the online course evaluation will open up from Wednesday to Friday. It'll just take you a few minutes to complete and um, we'll give you a 25% bonus on one quiz score. So what that'll do is kind of give you a 1% bump overall if you do the math. So you'll just get a, if the quiz is 10 points, we'll give you two and a half extra points, so on and so forth. Um, 
the evaluation this quarter is going to be useful for me primarily so that I can help the other faculty in the department plan for their autumn quarter classes. So I, I would really ask you all to take time, um, complete the evaluation and leave thoughtful feedback so that, um, you know, thinking about me as a department chair, helping the faculty who haven't done online teaching prepare for that in the autumn, if, if it's going to come to that. And, Many chemi classes, as we discussed last week, will, will probably be offered online and, and we're going to try and make as much as possible in person. So um, you've just experienced, you know, nine weeks of online chemical engineering education and your thoughts and opinions on how we can improve that are really valuable to me. So, um, yeah, please take the time to do that. I will uh, we'll welcome all the feedback that you want to send. I'm not seeing any questions coming in from um, any of the chat windows or any raised hands. So I'm going to assume that people don't have any additional topics they want to talk about before we jump in. And then I'll, uh, most of the time today, we'll be talking about the absorber fundamentals. And then um, <clears throat> I'll stop and ask if there's any questions. And if not, we'll talk about ion exchange and chromatography technology. Okay, so um, module four, you know, in a, in a traditional Chemi 435 class, we actually don't get to this until the last two lectures. So we're kind of right on pace with where I expected that we would be. Um, it's a fourth type of separation technology that um, kind of builds on what we just did. So as just a quick reminder, um, module three, the third thing we did was kind of filtration and membranes where we're using a barrier. And that barrier is a physical separation technique that will block the passage of one or more components to achieve a selective separation. So module four has the same kind of concept related to a physics or physical based separation. And here we're gonna use a special material. I'll talk about different types of materials that are sorbents um, for this process called adsorption, uh, which will capture selectively some materials or slow the passage of one or more components. So there's similar mechanisms. Uh, there's capturing a material and immobilizing it or slowing down one material are slightly different mechanisms, but the concept is the same. We have this stationary thing inside of a what is typically a column format and uh, that whatever that stationary object is, it is um, capturing or slowing down molecules. So this block flow diagram here shows that uh, we're feeding a column three components A, B, and C. And through adsorption, we are removing component C. So I, I draw this block flow diagram here just to illustrate and point out the fact that these are often semi-batch processes. So there's no, um, there's no continuous process that can operate just like this block flow diagram. Otherwise, you would have a, an infinite accumulation of component C. So we'll talk about the implications of that um, near the end of the adsorber section. And, and you'll see how this works in practice and industry um, when you have a, a one of your unit operations being a semi-batch module, how that factors in in a way that allows you to still run continuous processing. So in terms of technological examples, I have a couple that I'd like to just kind of briefly talk about. So the first one that um, I'll leave that little heart icon there for you to see. Um, the first one I think that's really interesting and, and maybe on a lot of your minds is, is uh, related to global warming and climate change. And this broad field of carbon capture is something that is squarely in the wheelhouse of what chemical engineers are working on. So it's an incredibly important area that chemical engineers are among the leading researchers. Uh, it involves discovery of new materials, optimization of processing, uh, techno-economic analysis. And uh, the goal, of course, is the removal of carbon dioxide um, from the atmosphere or the capture of it at uh, a point source emission like an automobile or a coal, uh, like a power plant where you're burning fossil fuels. So this diagram comes from a journal article. I have the link there in case you want to go look at it. It's at the bottom. You can, um, as a side note, this little thing is called a, a digital object identifier or DOI. So every journal publication receives a DOI and you can just paste it into Google and it will directly take you to the journal and uh, issue so you can look directly at that article. 
So what's on here are four different ways that chemical engineers have devised to do carbon capture. Uh, sometimes this is called carbon capture and sequestration. So I uh, just wanted to show this whole thing because we've already talked about a lot of this. So we um, talked about absorption earlier in the quarter. It was one of the first things we did. We just got done talking about membrane separations. This idea of this concept that's known as chemical looping, um, you'll learn the skills to model chemical looping in the autumn in Chemi 465. It primarily involves um, using chemical reactions in a um, what at the process level is a cycle in order to do things with CO2. And then what we're here today to talk about is this thing called adsorption, where we use a special material. Um, you may have heard already of zeolites. Um, you've probably heard of activated carbon. You've all seen activated carbon for sure. Um, you've seen those little bags that say silica gel and certain types of products you buy. Those are all adsorbents. Uh, and then there's all kinds of new materials that we're making in the labs, things like metal organic frameworks, metal oxides, et cetera. So I won't get into all this small text down here at the bottom. I did just want to point out this big universe of carbon capture and sequestration. If you're interested in learning more, um, this professor, uh, I know her reasonably well, Jen Wilcox, um, we're Facebook friends, so we communicate kind of regularly. She came to UW and gave a seminar several years ago, and she gave me a copy of her book. I'm showing the cover here. So. Um, I always laugh at cover art. It's kind of a hobby in my research group that we find um, interesting cover art. So um, here's an example of kind of egregious cover art. You have these giant molecules or tiny smokestacks. You have a net capturing molecules. It's kind of fun. But the worst thing from the chemist's point of view is the fact that you have three different uh, angles of CO2. So some artist kind of went to town here and uh, two out of three of those are, are not real and cannot be at that angle according to quantum mechanics. So uh, probably somebody needed some editorial revision of, of this cover art, but that's neither here nor there. If you wanna know more about the broad in, uh, interest and motivation for carbon capture technology, uh, Professor Wilcox gave a TED talk several years ago and you can find that really easily uh, at ted.com or on YouTube. And um, like most good TED Talks, it's uh, very engaging and interesting. And it's at a level that, of course, any of you would be able to understand, especially after completing this class. So carbon capture is really important for global warming. <clears throat> Adsorption is really important to Ken Mee, So I'll just list kind of two examples here. Another example um, that you may have heard less about in recent years, but it's kind of coming back. Um, it was very popular in the mid to late 90s and early 2000s. It's, uh, hydrogen storage or H2 storage. So in hydrogen storage, what we're trying to do is figure out ways to take H2, which is ex has an extremely high vapor pressure. It's one of the most um, volatile molecules we work with at Chemi. So it's very hard to li uh, liquefy or store in condensed phase. And figure out ways to store it. Um, you, you probably know that H2 can be used in a fuel cell in order to generate electricity and run electric motors. So it's a great way to store energy and to generate electricity via a fuel cell. There's actually a fuel cell class we'll teach in the department next spring. So you'll learn, you could learn a lot more about that in Professor Adler's class. But the storage of, of hydrogen is, is very challenging. Um, early proposals, for example, for fuel cell based cars um, proposed using compressed gas or liquid hydrogen and that winds up being sort of a very high safety concern if you're going to have a vehicle with a compressed gas tank on it or a vehicle with a liquid hydrogen tank on it. So the long-term plan um, in the U.S. is to develop a, what we call a materials-based strategy for storing hydrogen. And um, these are all different kinds of material-based strategies. And I'll just note here, here's an example of an adsorbent. This is a special type of custom molecule called a MOF or a metal organic framework. And here, what we're doing is we're taking uh, gaseous hydrogen and we're adsorbing it. So it's, it's technically becoming part of a solid phase because it's um, fizzy absorbing and sort of sticking on the walls of this porous material. Now the challenge is, is sort of figuring out a way to do this at scale and a, and a material that's robust and, and can last uh, for the lifetime of a vehicle. <clears throat> the really nice thing about H2 storage in a format like this is that the energy requirements to store it um, are, are much, much lower. So we don't need a crazy amount of pumping and compression of gases. 
or, or energy removal to liquefy hydrogen. Um, they can be stored at much more conditions that are kind of closer to ambient. So that's great. But the, um, the real roadblock is the technological innovation, the creation and discovery of the materials for the storage of hydrogen and, and CO2 remains a huge challenge. So that's a very active area of research in chemi and one that, that you could consider getting involved in if it's something you're really excited or passionate about. So we'll um, talk now about probably the most common adsorbent that's used in industry. So most chemical engineers are aware of this class of materials called zeolites. These are often called molecular cages or molecular sieves. So a sieve is something that sorts, it's like a, uh, a very fine filter. These are highly crystalline structures with really uh, precisely tunable pore sizes. So what we're doing when we synthesize a zeolite is customizing a network of pores or channels and those uh, that regular network of pores then can be used to um, have selective entry of molecules into these channels and then inside the zeolite atoms can absorb. We'll talk about the transport mechanisms involved in adsorption in a moment. And um, you can also add uh, additional atoms inside the zeolite. So here's a schematic of a zeolite called phagocyte. And you can see that there's a bunch of, each one of these um, kind of nodes here represents, a, a, I'm pretty sure, an atom. And um, there's a bunch of, you know, people spend their whole career studying zeolite, so I'm not gonna get into all the, the fine details here. But I'll just note that at some of these sites, like site three here, site two, Depending on the synthesis route you take to make, for example, phagocyte, you can add um, additional metal atoms. So uh, precious transition metals like platinum, rhodium can be used for catalysis purposes. And when we synthesize a zeolite and we impregnate it with individual atoms or clusters of atoms, um, like transition metals, we can then create something that does separations and catalysis at the same time. So this is really exciting. Um, this is a schematic here of all the different ways that zeolites can be tuned. So um, you can see they start with really simple precursors. So zeolites are, are primarily silica and ox dioxides or aluminum oxides. And these little small clusters have um, some kind of tetrahedral-like structure. And then the self-assembly of these materials into larger cages or structures is driven by thermodynamics and kinetics of how these small clusters of atoms come together. So there's a whole science and art related to this and you, you can form all sorts of different cage and porous structures. And just take a look here quickly. Um, you can see labeled pore sizes that are all kind of nanometer scale and sub nanometer. And some zeolites even have smaller, uh, you know, kind of angst, you know, 0.3 nanometer or three angstrom level pores are, are achievable in zeolites. So there's uh, tens of thousands, I think, of theoretical zeolites that could be synthesized. So that gives you some appreciation in terms of the versatility uh, of materials that you can have and all the crazy you know, different applications you might want to pursue for separating chemicals in a chemical process. So zeolites are really interesting. They're, as I said, they're incredibly important to chemical engineers. <clears throat> but one thing that hopefully now occurs to you is how, how the heck do you go from a material that has pore sizes on the order of one nanometer all the way to a chemical process. We don't have nanometer scale things that are part of our unit operations in general. So materials like zeolites and other materials are, are formed in, in the factory like where they're synthesized. So there's a chemical factory somewhere that makes zeolites. And in the zeolite factory, after they've done this synthesis into this uh, nice molecular cage structure, they form the materials into a, a pellet. So Adsorbers in industry are actually packed columns. So we pack the column uh, with these zeolites and then we could flow material over it. It's not that unlike um, the packed towers that we talked about in the um, absorber, stripping tower, and distillation column, although it's um, the packing is, is often much smaller because we we're, we're have a different purpose here. Um, but the, the concept is really the same in terms of uh, flow over a packed bed. So zeolites um, come in a lot of different um, shapes and forms and flavors. This is just, if you kind of Google image search for zeolites, you can see 
and get some appreciation. Um, they can have different colors depending on the materials they're made out of. We'll have different optical properties. They can have these different um, uh, kind of oblong or cylindrical shape features. These are, again, are all kind of length scaled on the order of millimeters and large, uh, millimeter and larger. And if you're looking at this a little funny, um, it is not a zeolite, it is a bowl of cereal. So um, kick cereal just looks like zeolites and I thought that um, I would just trick you all. So yeah, you can eat this, you cannot eat this or this. Um, doesn't really act like a sorbent. I guess it'll get soggy uh, if you pour milk on it. So zeolites are really established technology. You can go right now on eBay or Alibaba and buy your own zeolites. Um, and I'll just, I put this here kind of to show you one, the retail price is cheap, five to $20 per kilogram. So they, the price you would pay in industry for some of these materials is even lower than that. But they, they already come uh, pre-specified with pore size. So 3A, 4A, 5A means angstrom. So the characteristic pore size of the zeolite is so well specified that you can, you know, on a commercial website, order your zeolites with custom pore sizes. Uh, in the unit operations lab, we typically do an experiment for uh, finishing an ethanol water distillation. It's a step called polishing, where we remove water past the azeotrope. And you can do, uh, often in Chemi 437, experiments that will let you explore the efficacy of these different zeolites with respect to the characteristic pore sizes that are available. So there's a bunch of background about zeolites. Um, I want to talk about different transport mechanisms that are important. So there's kind of four levels of transport mechanism, and we'll go through them one at a time. Um, by now, you're familiar with all of them um, in terms of the, the main features. Um, so at the highest level here, level one, we have a packed bed. Uh, these are often called fixed bed systems, packed bed, uh, packed towers. It all kind of means the same thing in chemi. It just um, depends on which sub-industry you're talking about. And so the bed is literally packed with these pellets. And we have convective transport moving material through. So this schematic now, you can see there's a mixture of A and B going in at the beginning of our process. And I'm drawing here that we have mostly A coming out. So the... Um, the adsorbent here, maybe it's a zeolite, maybe it's something else, is uh, selectively removing B from this product stream. At the next level, um, what really matters here is, sorry, I'm just gonna zoom in a second. Um, there. Um, level two, kind of in this middle diagram right here, this is also, um, we've talked a little bit about this in the context of mass transfer, but um, here we expect to see boundary layer flow around a sphere. So at this level, uh, this length scale, the, the fluid is flowing over the particle and the film thickness that we have, it's, you know, that flow, that boundary layer flow is going to create a stagnant film. You probably remember that from earlier in the quarter. And that stagnant film is going to be um, kind of dormant or quiescent around whatever um, particle we have there in the bed. So the boundary layer flow is really important in order to understand the relationship between your fluid properties, the fluid flow, temperature and pressure inside the um, uh, fixed bed, and then the layer, the boundary layer thickness. Um, you can anticipate that we want that boundary layer thickness to be as small as possible. The third mechanism of transport that happens is thin film diffusion through the boundary layer. So what's happening here, what I've done is, is sort of in reflection or um, recognition that the, the boundary layer is probably effectively flat with regard to the diameter of the sphere, just like we did before. I'm drawing this as a flat layer. And some of the properties here are sort of preserved from what we've seen earlier in the quarter. So we have some uh, concentration of B. Remember, we're, we're removing B here in this example that I gave. Uh, we're removing B from the bulk. So we have some bulk concentration of B at the exterior of the boundary layer. So CB would be the bulk concentration. And then at the surface right here, we have some concentration, it could be zero, 
or it could be some equilibrium concentration that's due to um, you know, some sort of uh, equilibrium phenomenon. We typically write this as just CB star, uh, and then we would determine the boundary conditions on that layer depending on what was going on in the pore. Sometimes catalysis is happening, and so B is, is reacting really fast. You might remember a recent problem uh, that, that, had, that featured that. In that case, B would be, CB would be zero. Uh, in other cases, there is, is sort of a finite and small concentration of CB at the, the surface of the pore. So this is, gets us all the way now from bulk flow through the fixed bed all the way down to the surface of the adsorbent. But as I said, these are very porous materials. Their surface area to mass ratio are huge. And so the fourth mechanism of transport that we need to consider is a new type of molecular diffusion process. So what is happening then inside the pore, right? So I've drawn here a schematic of a channel. So that green dot kind of represents the top of the pore. What's going on is that when molecule B arrives at the edge of the, the surface of the catalyst pellet at the edge of the pore, it begins to diffuse inside the pore. So we didn't talk about this diffusion mechanism at all in class. If we were going to spend more time on adsorption or in 465, when you talk about heterogeneous catalysis, where the catalyst is often a pellet just like this, the diffusion mechanism becomes really important to characterize more. What I'll point out is that when the pore size gets really small, so you may want to go back and listen to this again later because it's a concept that's not obvious initially, but when the pore size gets really small, what happens is this quantity called the mean free path, and I believe at some point by now in one of your chemistry courses, you've heard about the mean free path. It's basically how far a molecule will travel via diffusion before it collides with something. So an ideal gas um, will have uh, molecular collisions with you know, molecules um, and the mean free path uh, can be determined from something called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and the velocity of molecules at a certain temperature. When you confine molecules to a pore and the length scale of that pore gets small enough, the, um, the mean free path actually becomes longer than the pore diameter. And what that means is that the collisions, sorry, uh, the collisions are dominated by the wall, uh, are the molecules hitting the wall of the pore. So that's a mechanism called Knudsen diffusion. It's, it's slightly different than ordinary or Fickian molecular diffusion. And, and it's really about the length scale of the, um, the confinement or the length scale of the pore, again, compared to the mean free path. So in, in ordinary molecular diffusion or Fickian diffusion, we're dominated by molecule-molecule collisions. That matters because we begin then to think about energy transfer, kinetic energy of molecules, temperature, all these things. Uh, I hope that you've been learning a little bit about in Kenny 457. All those things then begin to factor in the way that we model transport phenomena of molecules inside a pore. Now, I'm not going to talk about any of the, the, the transport in the pore itself beyond saying that. I did just want you to sort of have a, a semi, you know, a qualitative introduction to this important and fourth mechanism of molecular transport that I know you have, most of you probably haven't seen yet or thought about in this context. It is really important to be able to articulate what, you know, at the qualitative scale, what is happening when molecules flow over a, a fixed bed of porous material. So, then the question is really kind of the last question we want to ask is what happens inside the pores? So these molecules are diffusing into the pore. There's clearly some kind of driving force or else the molecules would not be entering the pores. Um, and what happens is that there is a selective adsorption to the surface of the pores. That's what an adsorbent is doing. So at the molecular scale, sub nanometer, eventually a collision happens that's just right and in this area of chemical engineering, we talk about molecules colliding with surface sites. And this is the way we draw this. We actually write it as a simple chemical reaction. 
So what this chemical reaction here means is that molecule B collides with surface site S, typical nomenclature in chem E. And then this conjugate species right here, B dot S, that's not a multiplication. What it means is we're recognizing that B has now become part of the solid phase by adsorption to a surface site. That's really important to understand. That'll come up again in mechanisms of catalysis. This can, this, what I told you just a moment ago, that can be a chemisorption mechanism where there's actual rearrangement of the electronic structure and maybe a new bond is being formed or a physisorption mechanism uh, where the molecule just kind of has a stick and it sits on the surface due to some driving force, maybe like electrostatic or a dispersion type driving force. In chemical engineering applications at the industrial scale, you're much more often going to see physisorption. And that's because the energetic requirement, so the enthalpy of adsorption is much lower when you do physisorption, uh, typically than in a chemisorption context. It can change a little bit when um, you undergo catalytic reactions. And so that's a different story you'll learn about in the autumn. But this is kind of the zero order uh, modeling we do of adsorption. And the question then becomes, you might be asking, well, when does the pellet get full and how, how quote, full will it get? Um, there is no, um, there's no way to, um, to kind of know that without doing experimental measurements. So the theoretical prediction is very challenging. It is uh, possible in some cases, we work on similar things in my group uh, related to adsorption. But um, you learned about equilibrium thermodynamics last quarter. And so let me just point out that this reaction here can be analyzed from a point of view of chemical reaction equilibrium. And you know from previous chemistry and chemithermal classes that we can write an equilibrium constant KEQ as the exponent of negative delta G over RT. So that's delta G, the uh, free energy of adsorption in this case. So delta G would be the, the free energy of B dot S minus the individual species enthalpies of a, of a site and of species B. And that, that equilibrium constant, if we're talking about concentrations, we often use partial pressures in this context, but it's gonna be proportional and not exactly equal to the ratio of the equilibrium species concentrations. So again, this could be a concentration-based equilibrium expression or a partial pressure-based equilibrium expression. In either case, um, there's a unit conversion. That's why this isn't exactly equal, but the, uh, this part on the left, this equilibrium constant equality um, is always true. And then there's a very you know one-to-one -one correspondence vis-a-vis um, -a, -vis a, a unit correction to relate it to the partial pressures at equilibrium. So uh, this is always true, this equilibrium adsorption thermodynamics. And uh, it, it does become more complicated when we depart from the, the very ideal or simplistic type of adsorption. And even within the, I, the concept or idea of physisorption, there are really a ton of different ways that adsorption can take place. There's different mechanisms. Um, just as an initial kind of thought experiment to illustrate this, whether you imagine that molecule B sticks right down in an isolated fashion and that other molecules B stick down in kind of the exact same rate or with the exact same frequency, or in some cases, the adsorption of one molecule of B would then promote the adsorption of a second molecule of B at a faster rate. So you could have a site-specific adsorption that's being promoted by, it, by the adsorption of a first B molecule. So um, that's one way that you could easily imagine that, that there might be um, many, many different ways that we describe adsorption mechanisms. This is important. You'll see why in, in just a second, but it's important because we need a theoretical description for how adsorption happens in order to be able to model the process at scale, um, make estimates of the value of one adsorbent material over another, et cetera. So, um, the equilibrium thermodynamics, KEQ, for example, will determine how much, at a given temperature, uh, how much material we can load, like how, uh, how full can we make this material of gas molecules be? Then the question is, well, what happens when the material gets full? Because then our process is done, 
we will no longer be able to selectively remove B uh, as we're talking about in this example in, in order to um, you know, do separations in our process. So you can imagine that we, what we don't wanna do is fill the absorber or the adsorber. We don't wanna fill the adsorber and then have to stop the process, empty it with you know, our dirty pellets, throw those away in the trash or send them to an incinerator and then add more pellets. That's not a sustainable way to run a process. You're creating a ton of waste and it's not an efficient way to run a process because it's highly disruptive. Um, so one of the, the nice things is that since adsorption is an equilibrium driven process, we can shift the equilibrium left and right. So KEQ um, can increase or decrease. And um, um, what that means is uh, we can actually use this to um, regenerate the material, the absorbance. So this is often run uh, by doing changes in temperature or pressure. Um, and we call this pressure swing adsorption, or we call this temperature swing adsorption. So either temperature or pressure can be used to shift the equilibrium and begin to regenerate our sorbent materials. And this is a block flow diagram um, of a PSA system, pressure swing adsorption. And so we, you can see a bunch of control valves here, these little um, dual triangles are control valves. And so what typically might happen is we would be running the process here with the left adsorber tower. And then um, after a while, the adsorber would be completely loaded or full. And then we would have to switch the pressure and we would begin, we would move our product stream over here to the right hand side. Um, so then the process could continue as normal. So uh, that would be fine. And while that's happening, so while we're loading the right hand adsorber, what we'll do is we'll change the pressure here uh, in order to selectively remove material. Uh, in this case, we're doing an O2, N2 separation, and we'll selectively remove the nitrogen from that sorbent in order to make it available again once the right-hand adsorber fills up. So at a high level, this is a uh, kind of how Pressure, pressure swing adsorption works, TSA, temperature swing adsorption works, the exact same mechanism. And um, this allows you to use this semi-batch process in, a, in a, basically what is a, effectively a continuous fashion because between the two of these towers over time, you're able to sort of sustain a continuous product flow rate. Um, in this case, it would be separated oxygen. So two more concepts. Um, related uh, to adsor adsorber design that are really important. The first one is this thing called an adsorption isotherm. This is the primary tool that chemical engineers use in order to collect lab, lab data at the pilot scale or the bench scale uh, to, to uh, determine quantities like that KEQ value in order to do scale up. So, you know, this is incredibly common in chem -E. We have these idea, this thing called the adsorption isotherm. And um, the concept with an adsorption isotherm is that we do experiments in an extremely well-controlled temperature chamber. So the temperature is controlled. All we, you know, these are always done at the same spot. And we do an experiment where we put in a small amount of material. So we start at very, very small concentrations and we wait and sometimes these experiments can be quite long so we uh, we have a chamber we have a sorbent in the middle and we wait a very long time while the system comes to equilibrium and then we determine how much has been absorbed so that can be done by gas phase analysis it could be done by weighing the sorbent there's a bunch of different things you can do and then um, you do another experiment so you add you add some additional material you do another experiment with clean sorbent and uh, you find out how much it can absorb. So what you're looking at here um, in this graph is uh, on the x-axis, it's partial pressure, but that could be also comp you know, concentration. It's a measure of the, the partial, you know, the, the mole fraction of the material that's there in this closed system. And you can't read this very well, I apologize for the low quality, but here we're looking at adsorption of gases like CO2, N2, um, and different sorbent materials. 
The y-axis shows how much material has been adsorbed and it's on a per gram basis. So uh, per gram of material absorbent, if this is a, you know, for example, a zeolite, I think that's what it is, or one of those MOF materials, et cetera. So um, each symbol here is an experimental data point. We've let the system come to equilibrium and we've measured how much is left in the chamber and how much is there on the sorbent material, how much has been absorbed. And this relationship that you're looking at here is something uh, that's a very traditional type of isotherm. So um, at very low levels, let me kind of walk you through what's happening, at very low levels of concentration, in this case CO2, you can see that we have kind of rapid um, uptake of material. So we're able to kind of really capture all the material that we're adding to that chamber because the, the sorbent is empty. And then as we get out here, we get out into this plateau region where um, even though we're adding more material, we're not really absorbing more into the, the, let's say the zeolite. So that means we've loaded the material and at that temperature, now we can determine what the loading is. So this is modeled, this curve right here, with something called an adsorption isotherm. Um, the model that's most commonly used by chemical engineers because it's the simplest is something called the Langmuir isotherm. So Langmuir was actually a chemical engineer, I believe, that um, discovered a way to do this modeling. And the isotherm shows us the relationship between how much material is adsorbed. This is often called surface coverage uh, for historical reasons and the, the partial pressure of the species there. So um, this is the Langmuir adsorption isotherm. It's a very simple model. It can be, you will in fact derive this in your kinetics and reaction engineering class in the autumn. And it tells us that the surface coverage of B, so again, that's from zero to 100%, how full the sorbent material is. The surface coverage is related to the equilibrium constant times the partial pressure over one plus the equilibrium constant times the partial pressure. This is derived from an analysis of equations like this. The cool thing is when you do these experiments that we talked about here, each one of these experiments can then allow you to do regression and to determine what the equilibrium constant is. So that's how experimentally uh, equilibrium constants are determined for uh, adsorption systems. So the isotherm uh, is specific to a material, a composition, and a temperature. And what that allows you to do then is take that and, and use it for other calculations and scale up. It's transferable provided you have the same material for your uh, sorbent. The other thing that's really important to measure kind of at the uh, lab or pilot scale is a quantity called the breakthrough curve. So as I've noted now multiple times in this lecture, we have a semi-batch process happening. And it, what that means is eventually, uh, even if we have a really good sorbent, like that example before, where I'm taking away B, and at the beginning of the process, I'm getting all of it. So I'm taking away all of the B, and um, there's none of it. Um, eventually, the sorbents fill, and we begin to leak, and we have breakthrough. So the material B will eventually come out the other end of that packed bed system, and, and we have to know when and be able to sort of model it. So what is done is the breakthrough curve is a quantity that's measured in lab, again, at pilot scale. And it, it's an essential relationship between the time to achieve breakthrough, uh, the geometry, the packing, the flow conditions, and uh, um, how you'll run the process kind of at the, at the plant scale. One of the really cool things in chemical engineering are scaling relationships. So by doing the experiment properly, you can design the scaled up reactor at the industrial scale just from doing the experiments at the benchtop scale. So um, that's why scaling relationships often use ratios of dimensionless groups in order to uh, um, do proper scale up of equipment. So a breakthrough curve, uh, there's two different ways to plot it. This is one example. And so here on the X axis is distance. So this is how far we're going down the length of that fixed bed uh, process from zero to L all the way to the end. It can be vertical or horizontal. Um, in, in practice, it doesn't matter. 
And then on the y-axis is a quantity that's scaled from zero to one. And it is a relationship between the concentration of whatever species we're absorbing, C, and the concentration at the feed. So how much is coming in? And then at some distance down the column, uh, we're taking, say, experimental measurements, and we're, we're doing that ratio. So those stripes could be, for example, a place where we can do an experimental measurement. Um, so if you pause the, re you know, if you pause time and you take these measurements everywhere down the reactor, you will get a curve that looks something like this. So at some time one, this would be the breakthrough curve. And what this means is at the beginning of the reactor over here, we have basically a ratio of one, which means our concentration of B in the, um, um, in the absor absorber, sorry, I keep calling it a reactor because this is also very relevant in packed bed reactor design and I've taught that class. So I apologize for that, I'm trying to catch myself. But at the beginning of the absorber, um, we had this kind of ratio of one, meaning there's all the materials there. And then at this time one value, around halfway down the absorber, it's zero. And that's because we've done proper absorption of all the material in system. Now what's going to happen is that at some time two, uh, T2 later on, the materials kind of shifted further down. And um, because we've kind of effectively made the beginning of the absorber dead, and now the curve will more or less be the same shape because of the isotherm that we just talked about. But now it's shifted down. And you can see that just here in this time two slot, we're beginning to see some material potentially leaving the absorber. So what this means is the second way to do a breakthrough curve analysis is plotting the information this way. So here, we're just watching at the outlet of the absorber. And our x-axis is now time. So I'm doing experiments every certain number of minutes. And I'm measuring the concentration out of whatever species I'm trying to absorb. So at the beginning, of course, that concentration is 0 because nothing is coming out. And then it's not going to immediately spike. It's eventually going to start to grow slowly. So this is a typical shape of a breakthrough curve. There's often a very linear region, and then it begins to curve off at, uh, at the top. And a typical process will have some cutoff ratio. 95% is an example your book mentioned, where once we've kind of had liftoff and we're, we've filled all our sorbent, then um, what we need to do is shut that process down. If we're doing TSA or PSA, we'll switch over to the other um, fixed bed, and then we'll begin our regeneration process. So we have some end time now that's defined based on when the outlet composition reaches our cutoff ratio. So the breakthrough curve is an experiment that's often done in Chemi 437 with zeolites uh, in order, again, to look at uh, this polishing step of ethanol water mixtures. Um, and now you have some kind of understanding of, of these characteristic quantities that are used. So I, I'm going to finish today, but I want to take a quick break. So it's 1249 right now. Let's come back at 1253. And then I've got a couple more things I want to talk about with regard to ion exchange and chromatography. So I'll be back in just a moment and we will carry on. If you have questions about absor uh, absorbers, send them to Maria. And if I don't see any questions when I come back at 1253, I, I'll just assume it's okay to move on.
Okay, we can go ahead and continue. I, I don't see uh, Maria sending any questions via chat, so I'm gonna move on. Um, you can find, if you're curious what, what might be fair game for the quiz, you can find the learning objectives updated for this lecture. Let's talk now briefly about uh, a related technology called Ion Exchange. So this is really relevant to all of us who live here in the state of Washington because of the need for treating nuclear waste at the Hanford site in the Tri-Cities. I'm sure um, if you're from the state of Washington, you know about the Hanford site, and if you're not, you may have also heard about it. And uh, there's a lot of waste there that is contaminated with isotopes um, of ionic species, cesium and strontium. Um, and the cleanup of this waste is taking place in part with a technology called ion exchange. Well, this is often called ion exchange adsorption and sometimes it's called ion exchange chromatography. Um, it's a type of adsorption process uh, that's done sometimes with multiple columns and it's facilitated with a chemical reaction. So um, there's kind of mixing two things here together. The chemical reaction is um, a, an ionic reaction and it's uh, not super complicated to understand so we can at least walk through the fundamentals. If you are not from a city, so if you're from a place that had well water or other types of water sources that are not from a large municipal water source, uh, and if you're from the eastern part of the state, your house uh, might have had something called a water softener. So my house did growing up, and I was always loading water softeners with uh, these pellets that dissolve over time. And this is another type of ion exchange. So soft and hard water refers to the amount of ions that are there in, uh, and the type of ions that are there in a species. And uh, water softeners are, are used very commonly in residential um, treatment of uh, drinking water as a way to not make it safer, but kind of improve qualities that people tend to like. Oftentimes too, water softeners are used to remove things like iron um, and calcium uh, because those will build up in your pipes in your house over time. So, um, sorry, skip ahead there. Uh, ion exchange fundamentals. So, ion exchange involves, as I said, chemical reaction equilibrium. And here, the sorbent or the pellet that's that's in the ion exchange um, material. Um, is made from a resin. So we, we talk about resins in ion exchange. It's often a polymer resin, so kind of a hard plastic. And it's a special type of polymer or material that has fixed charges. Um, so the resin, here's an example. This is just illustrating this squiggly line like it's a polymer chain. Again, these are beads that might be on the order of millimeter size. And the, the backbone of this polymer chain carries fixed charges. In this case, they're negative charges. and the bead is kind of preloaded with cations uh, or whatever the counter ion or charge would be. So um, here we have kind of this resin that's now weakly bound and we're gonna flow uh, typically aqueous um, solutions over the, the fixed bed. So we have uh, particles there that are, that are um, in that fixed bed and there's a reaction equilibrium that happens uh, called ion exchange. So the main concept is that we have some ion in our aqueous solution, in this case, again, a cation, and that ion is gonna outcompete ion two to bind the resin. So the kinetics or thermodynamics would favor uh, a swapping of the cation. We still have charge neutrality in this case, but now we're sort of moving, you can see in this schematic, we're moving ion two into solution and we're binding ion one to the resin. So why might we want to do this? If, if the ion is something uh, that's a material from a nuclear process like cesium or strontium, um, and then the ion that's bound to the resin is uh, something that's rather harmless like a proton or another cation that can be added to the water, this is a good deal. So we're able to sort of just uh, contaminate the resin and remove that material that we don't want in the water via this ion exchange process. So like the adsorber, Ion exchange is of course a fixed bed process, it's semi-batch. And what that means is the material will either need regeneration or in the case where you're using it for cleanup of toxic waste, the resin is then often the final fate of that material. So the resin would then be removed from the adsorber and then placed in a, 
you know, depending on the, the severity of the toxicity or health hazard, if it's radioactive, uh, of course, there's a whole host of things that need to do uh, be done. Again, we're not making the material not radioactive, we're just removing it from solution so that um, we can have it immobilized, which is in many cases a better way to store waste that's hazardous or toxic. Deionized water is made um, very often in a two-step ion exchange for two columns. So what we do in one step is swap out cations with protons, H plus, and then we swap out anions with hydroxide, OH minus, and you know that we can then uh, expect that in solution, those will equilibrate and will form additional water molecules. So that's uh, one way that ion exchange is, is working there. Question came in, that's great. Um, in Chemi 435, we learned that adsorption takes a really long time, like a week to reach full equilibrium. How much time do people in industry allow for adsorption to occur to make the process profitable? Oh, sorry, that's Kenny 455 uh, clarification. So you have to be a little careful when you simply say that adsorption can take a long time or not to reach equilibrium. In fact, we're talking today about a kind of continuous process. So it's not as though we're charging this column and then closing the valve and then holding it until equilibrium is reached. In fact, what we're doing is we're, we're flowing material over the column and we're expecting that while it flows over, it, uh, we will reach or approach some equilibrium. This is not unlike what we do uh, when we analyze or talk about um, distillation or absorption, right? We, we had this idea that we wanna reach equilibrium and we talked about many times in class how mass transfer limitations um, things like mixing, uh, all the mass transfer concepts that we talked about with regard to liquid liquid or um, liquid vapor interaction uh, and reaching e vapor liquid equilibrium, the same concepts kind of apply. What we need to do is facilitate transfer of material into, um, into the sorbent, moving that gaseous or uh, one species from the liquid phase into the solid. So, I, I think it's, I would not necessarily uh, agree. I don't think universally you wanna have this idea that adsorption takes a week to reach equilibrium. That's um, gonna be very, very dependent on the sorbent, how much material is there, what are the temperature and pressure. There's certainly experiments that, that run for a week in order to, again, reach equilibrium and there's experiments that are much faster. So um, indeed, some of these experiments that we talked about in the isotherm measurement uh, may take up to a, you know several days. Uh, it, it really just depends on all of the variables. So um, in in this case, you know how much time I guess was the nature of the question. Do you have to allow uh, in order to make the process profitable? Um, in the context of a continuous process, time is really related to the velocity of the of the stream going through. That's you'll learn about something called space time or residence time in in Chemi 465. And so the question here is really how much residence time do the uh, molecules need in order to um, you know achieve our process goals? And we can change residence time two ways. We can make the unit operation bigger so that the 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 ratio of the volume of the unit operation to the flow is uh, larger, or we can slow down the flow. In either case, the time constant then will increase and we have a better opportunity to reach equilibrium, to remove more material, so on and so forth. And as to the question of how much time do you need in order to be profitable, uh, again, I, I feel like a broken record sometimes, that's the subject of Chemi 485. Um, there's of course a trade-off if you're running the process more slowly, you're making less product, but maybe the product is of a higher purity. Likewise, if you have to have a giant vessel or many vessels in order to achieve that very long residence time, in that case, the operational cost and the, the fixed capital cost to build the facility will also be much higher. So that's a great question and it's a great way to begin to think about like how do we take the molecular scale properties like how long it takes to reach a, uh, equilibrium, what are the equilibrium thermodynamics and kinetics? Those are fundamental chemistry and physics material properties. Then how do we project that onto a thing like profitability or sustainability of the plant? Uh, that is really the nature of chemical engineering and I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, and it's really, I think, one of the most fun things about the remainder of the chemi curriculum. We begin to put all these pieces together and begin to see holistically how you know, 
being able to do equilibrium and thermodynamics connects to your ability to say, is this or is this not profitable? So thank you for that. So um, that's all I had to say about ion exchange. I briefly just wanted to introduce it as a, uh, you may see that nomenclature and I want you to just really think about that as a, a special type of adsorption. And the final thing um, that I'll talk about briefly is a third type of adsorber that's very special called chromatography. So chroma, um, I don't uh, believe it's Greek. I don't recall if it's Latin or Greek. It means color. And it's called chromatography uh, because when it was discovered originally uh, in early 1900s, it was uh, discovered kind of accidentally as a way to separate colored pigments from plants. So you probably are aware that um, people have uh, for very, you know, thousands of years been able to get dyes uh, and, and coloring inks and pigments from nature, from different types of plants, from uh, trees, you know, shrubs, flowers, etc. And um, the discovery was really uh, kind of serendipitous. So plant extracts were dissolved in ethanol. I don't remember what type of plant it was. It for sure was green. So there was a lot of chlorophyll. Um, and it, uh, that, that ethanol solution was poured over a column uh, with solid lime. Lime is calcium carbonate and it's a natural sorbent. So calcium carbonate um, has a highly porous structure and it's, a, uh, it's certainly a material that can um, uh, function in the same way that, that I've been talking about today. So what happens, uh, here's a, a modern version of this 1903 experiment. If you take grass and grind it up in ethanol, and you pour it over uh, a strip of paper that's coated in lime, uh, and then use gravity to separate it, what will happen is some of the molecules will begin to move at different speeds, and we'll talk about the mechanism why, and you begin to separate all these pigments. So this is kind of an interesting experiment um, in that you can identify individual pigment, pigment molecules uh, based on this separation process. Uh, that is a type of adsorption, but um, it, it's called uh, chromatography. So um, chromatography is probably, I would argue, one of the most important, if not the most important, analytical chemistry technique. So if you're doing uh, undergraduate research in any labs where there are wet chemistries happening, uh, in Chemi 437 next winter, you will use a chrom uh, chromatography and learn more about it. Uh, the really common flavors of it are gel permeation chromatography, or GPC and high performance liquid chromatography or HPLC. The example I'll talk about on the next slide is related to protein separations in industry and it is a type of chromatography that is also really important for production of um, biologics, production of pharmaceutical compounds, um, and antibody production. So in industry, um, this is a picture of a plant where protein separation is occurring, and those are very large uh, chromatographic columns, and uh, it's a bio safety production facility. So in BSL facilities, you can see everybody's wearing all their clean room stuff, clean shoes, uh, armbands here, hair nets. So if you haven't had the chance to visit one of these facilities, uh, you would not be able to enter without all of this uh, clean gear, even just to stand near uh, some of the production equipment. There's a lot of reasons why that is. I uh, won't get into it today. And protein separations are achieved with something called affinity chromatography. So in the last example, we had calcium carbonate as this stationary thing, and we're flowing over a solution of ethanol and pigment molecules. And there was some reason that the pigments began to move at different velocities, and you had these bands of color that was showing you how the separation was uh, happening in real time. In affinity chromatography, the column is loaded with these small little cages. So these are types of very specific molecular cages that will either lock into a specific part of a protein or they'll lock into, um, you know, there may be a ligand that the protein could lock, you know, there's many different mechanisms that a protein would lock onto one of these cages, um, but it, it'll be highly specific. Nature is extraordinarily specific in the design of proteins. And as a result, when you flow this mixture in protein chromatography, we call them, it's a mixture of analytes. And when we flow that mixture through this column, 
In this case, it's illustrated with this little colored red hexagon. Um, the red, the, um, the receptors that are immobilized in our stationary phase begin to fill up. So let's say those red hexagons correspond to proteins that are made to be um, used as a biologic or a, a protein-based therapy. So we load up the column. That's what's happening in this silver thing right back here. Like an absorption process, it, it um, will eventually become full. And then um, there may be a, a, an additional step called dilution. So we may inject a salt to change the pH. We may change the temperature. There's a bunch of different things you can do to facilitate removal. Or just by equilibrium thermodynamics, as you're flowing more solvent, um, you actually have this same relationship where um, you shift the equilibrium from the bound state here to the unbound state. So all of that, as you might recall from Chemi 326, can be shifted one way or the other based on the concentrations. So uh, there's a number of different ways to achieve this step of elution. It can be driven or it can be passive. But in either case, what happens at the end, you know, at the end in this case, is that the, the final cut coming out of this column is go indeed going to be um, a, a solution of the molecules we want, these red hexagons or whatever proteins this might be. So all chromatography basically works in the same manner. Um, a good way to think about it is the following. Um, you know, chromatography is ordering our molecules. We have a mixture of molecules. In this cartoon that I drew here, there are different sizes. So there are types of size chromatography. And um, in, in this example, we're gonna imagine that there's some sort of gel phase and that gel is going to interact with the molecules differently uh, due to the physical properties of the molecules. And in some cases, the, slow mole the small molecules um, move slower. You might expect that small would always often mean faster, but if that gel offered a way for the small molecules to sort of embed for some time or uh, maybe selectively adhere, uh, the small molecules could slow down. And so an ordering will naturally occur if the smaller you are, the slower you move through the column, the feed of this mixture of different size molecules will then become ordered and the larger molecules will leave the column first. Chromatography always has two things, a, a mobile and immobile phase. So in these examples, I've talked about protein separation, et cetera. The mobile phase is an aqueous solution of some molecules. Sometimes the mobile phase is gas. So we have gas chromatography. Um, there's lots of different um, types of uh, uh, mobile phases, uh, liquid, gas, et cetera. Uh, and then there's an immobile phase. So the inside of this column is embedded with something. It could be a gel, it could be something like calcium carbonate. Uh, there's all types of examples of immobile phases. And, and these chromatographic columns are very specific to the type of chemistry that you're working on. So um, the reordering, as it were, of the molecules could occur for, for many, many different reasons, but the underlying mechanism um, or the underlying concept is the same um, in terms of there being something about that immobile phase and the relationship between how the molecules interact that uh, the molecules would uh, be reordered. So that's in a big picture chromatography, and it seems very similar to adsorption, and it is in many ways but I did just want to kind of highlight a couple of the difference, differences. So like adsorption, chromatography is still a flow through process. So we're still um, in general, continuously flowing that mobile phase through. And depending on what type of way we're running chromatography, um, we may be doing a, a, an injection of an aliquot of material, or there are even semi-continuous or continuous chromatographies in industry. Um, so it's best to think about this like adsorption as a semi-batch process. Um, but unlike adsorption, in the adsorption examples we looked at, something is always staying behind and the column is going to become progressively loaded over time. In chromatography, that's not the point. The point is we're designing this immobile phase in order to slow down the molecules but not to stop them completely. That's why we use chromatography to analyze mixtures of molecules because um, the uh, 
injection of molecule, like a mixture, a sample of a mixture from a reactor in a plant, for example, uh, that, that analysis would often be done with chromatography. And that mixture, we want to know everything that's there. We don't want to take anything out. So um, depending on how you're operating the mobile phase, the mixture will come more, more or less quickly. And uh, there's something at the end of the column in analytical chemistry called a detector. And that detector would then give you information that would allow you to uh, assign identity to all of the, um, the signals that you're getting out of your apparatus. So you'll see a lot more about this in Chemi 437. There's a whole unit on chromatography because of its importance in uh, helping us analyze uh, composition of mixtures. But the main concept um, in, in chromatography it really to kind of take away is that we're not holding anything back. We're just reordering the way molecules are coming out through a continuously flowing process. So that's all I wanted to say about those last two types of adsorption technology. We're about out of time. Um, we are done with all of the new technical content in class. I'll make an announcement, but I do not plan to hold lecture on Thursday. I have no new additional information and I've crammed your heads with a lot of information. So I suggest you take time on Thursday to um, brush up, to study, to think about what we talked about today. Um, and think about kind of some of the other quizzes you've had and just continue to the best of your ability working through uh, the remainder of the course material. You all know, I think I've hopefully been effective at communicating to you that uh, I'm here to support you if, if you do need anything. And I've tried to give you um, a number of different ways to, to reach out and let me know if there's something we need to do to help you uh, kind of get over the finish line. So I just want to close kind of by saying that um, one of my very favorite things in, in class is getting to know students, uh, is that personal interaction. And I know that's one of the things you all really love about our department. So uh, I've missed that very dearly this quarter. It has been really challenging to sit here and just kind of talk into the void, but it's, uh, I know you're there and I know that in the autumn, I'm gonna get the chance to meet most of you. And I, I really look forward to that. So. I apologize in advance if I have no idea who you are. I haven't met most of you. Um, so, you know, when you see me, please come up and introduce yourself. Remind me that you were in class with me last spring. And just know that I, I really do look forward to meeting all of you. And uh, next year, when you're seniors, getting to know you a little more and, and being part of finishing your chemical engineering journey and helping you move on to the next stage, uh, next step in your careers. So it's 1.15. Um, that concludes my lecture and it concludes all of the new lecture material for Chem E435. I have a few minutes, I'll stick around. If there's additional questions, feel free to unmute your mic and chat. Otherwise, uh, I will be in office hours this week. I'm planning to be there. And so do, do jump in if you'd like to chat about anything. Otherwise, I uh, wish you the best. Good luck finishing your material and, and uh, do take care of yourselves. Uh, this is really, uh, we're way off the charts in terms of being in, in an unprecedented moment. So take care of yourselves and, and uh, just keep doing your best. Have a nice afternoon, everybody, and uh, we'll be in touch. I don't see any additional questions coming in, so I am going to end the Zoom recording session, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Bye.